All right, welcome to our bare bone series on sonship suffering. This is session one. Uh, today we're going to be talking about suffering. I know everybody suffers one way or another, to one extent or another. People don't suffer the same, and we all know that. And I don't really need to list all the different ways in which people suffer because I think most of us are pretty familiar with that. When it comes to our apostle, he often talks about suffering in broad categories. You know, when he's using words like uh, tribulations, there's a lot of different things that could go into tribulation, persecutions. There's a lot of different ways that people are persecuted. Uh, infirmities, he, he uses that as well. Then he uses the word necessity. So there's things that uh, comprise that category, perils, all of that kind of business. So this is not what I'm about to put on the board is not in your notes, but you know it. The reason I didn't put it in your notes is because you know it. But the reason I'm going to do it is because it occurred to me too late to put in your notes that there will be people watching this recording that don't have your background. And so I wanted to make sure that they understood this. This will And this will frame the study. Um, basically, in your Bible, the Apostle Paul talks about two different categories of suffering. Everything can pretty much fit into these two categories. I'm going to use the acronyms just for brevity, but the first one is the sufferings of this present time. That is the sufferings that everybody encounters, whether they're lost or saved. It has nothing to do with that. Now, we're going to talk about what some of those could be in just a moment because they'll be relevant to the verses that we're going to be looking at. But the other set is going to be the sufferings of Christ. Now, the sufferings of Christ are very specific. Those are things that you would suffer. In fact, let's just do a list of this. There are some people that in the world, just simply because of their faith in Christ and the fact that they are looked at as a believer in Jesus Christ, there is a general policy of evil that is at work in the world in which these people may suffer to one extent or another just because of their faith. They may also suffer because of their witness. They may suffer also for righteousness sake. And what I'm talking about when I say for, for righteousness sake is they may be suffering because they're not willing to join in with the evil that others are going. And you know what? You've, we've all seen that. I want you to join in. And when you don't, it makes them obviously look like they're doing what they're doing. And they don't like that. They want everybody to... To, to do what they're doing. So I'm giving you just a few of the things on the sufferings of Christ. But then those also become very individualized so that there is a more personal policy of evil that is made to, and I'm just going to give it to you in the way in which you're all familiar with it. The first thing is, is it seeks to corrupt the message so that you are no longer being a mouthpiece for the truth, but you become a mouthpiece for the untruth. Failing that, the next thing is to attack the messenger. And that is for the and and that's where a lot of these sufferings are coming from. That's to make you stop. Okay? And then the last one of course is to discredit the messenger so that if you won't stop talking nobody'll listen to you because they've ruined your character in one way or another. So these are things that would come under the sufferings of Christ. Now look I'm defining the sufferings of this present time to be those things that are happening to anybody, saved or lost, just because they live in a fallen world. Now, we could give, and I'm going to give you some examples of that, but I want you to understand that when we're talking about the sufferings today, I'm actually talking about all of these together. And, uh, and, I, and I'm doing that because that's what our apostle does. You're going to, we're going to read some verses today in which he is going to group together the various kinds of suffering. Now, there are those that see the sufferings of this present time as being the suffering that takes place because, let's say, you are teaching the mystery, okay? Uh, the, the mystery of Christ, or because you see Paul as your apostle. In other words, it's this present dispensation of grace. That's the way they're seeing it. So if you if you're dispensational, if you're talking about Paul, if you're talking about grace, if you're talking about the mystery, 
or if you're talking about the individual components of the mystery, you might come under attack in one way or another uh, with that. And they say, that's the suffering of this present time. I, I, I really am reluctant to see it that way because those things I just mentioned all fit very well right under the sufferings of Christ. And if you, and if you make the sufferings of this present time dispensational suffering, and that's the same thing as the suffering of Christ. Now you have nothing that describes the suffering that people go through just because they're alive and on the planet. And so I and I see Paul mentioning those things. And so as a result, I I just lumped in that dispensational suffering over here, you know, because again, that would be the message, right? And if and and if Satan doesn't like that, it'd be attack the messenger. All right, so the sufferings of this present time, that can range from everything from an accident. Maybe you're just sitting at the red light, minding your own business. Somebody's not paying attention. They're texting, and they run into the back of your car and injure you. You may recover from that, or you may have lasting damage that goes on for the rest of your life. Who knows? But the thing is, God didn't ordain that. And that wasn't Satan trying to get you off the chessboard. Okay? So because of that, that's just, it, it's just part of living in this world. You could be climbing a ladder and you know what? A gust of wind comes up. You weren't anticipating, lose your balance, you know, fall off, break your arm or whatever. Those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about that we look at and we say, look, this is not God doing it to us. And it's not something Satan is necessarily doing, but these are things that happen because we do live in a, not in a perfect world, but in a fallen world. Okay, now everybody I think has got that. Now what I want to do here is I want to take these and I want to put all that together and I'm going to get a, I'm going to, I'm going to start listing some things down here below because I see Paul, I know I just did this one, but everybody, you understand what I'm talking about when I say that now the sufferings of this present time. So we're going to take all of those together and we're going to begin to deal with this because, and, and I do want to talk about why. We're doing this. <clears throat> uh, years ago in my ministry, um, I felt helpless to be able to give uh, answers to people who were going through certain types of adversities, troubles, sufferings, infirmities, different kinds of things like that. These sometimes, I mean, I, I don't think I had a complete answer for this either, but this was a little easier because it was spiritual in nature. But for these kinds of things, we at the church where I was for many, many years in Louisiana, uh, kind of trying to describe all of our the staff, our inability to really know what to say to people here, it occurred to somebody on the staff who said it one day in a staff meeting, and then we all kind of just picked up that language to describe it. All of our counseling to people basically boiled down to pray, read your Bible, and do the best you can. And I'm not saying that to our credit. I'm saying, I, I mean, you know, because we we all kind of felt like, what what do we do here, and what is going to happen? So I want to go beyond that. Now I couldn't go beyond that back then. Thankfully, I can go beyond that now because that advice is way too general. Just tell someone to pray, read your Bible, and do the best you can. That Bible becomes an awfully big book. And, and what are you going to pray? I mean, everybody has an idea what they'd like to pray, but too often they're praying things that don't happen. So what are we doing then? Okay, so this study is not, however, about the different kinds of suffering. Because, again, I think we're pretty familiar with that. It is, however, about the advantage of learning to go through sufferings with the doctrine that is contained in Paul's epistles. So tonight I'm going to give you 15 benefits for going through the doctrine that way. And I and 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 the reason now you might be wondering why in the world are you don't do, doing that? And, and and so I'm calling I'm calling the series Sonship Suffering. Look, I realize there are folks that are not crazy about that title. Um, but look, all, all, all sonship, you just, just, look, I'm saying sonship, but look, anytime you add S-H-I-P to a word, 
you're talking about a state of being with whatever the prefix to that is. So if, if, if I say citizenship, that is the state of being a citizen. Everybody gets that. Well, let me ask you. I mean, did the, does the Bible talk about, you know, that we become the sons of God? Well, it does. And so as a result, sonship is merely the state of that. And so I believe there is a life for every person who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. There is a particular kind of life. I'm not saying they all do the same things, but there is a particular kind of life that they are supposed to be living. And I would call that life their sonship life. In other words, their life as they are living in the status of being a son of God. Now, that does not sound foreign to me. That's To me, that's not a leap because the Bible talks about that, okay? And so if you're saved and you're a son, and I know some of you are daughters. I'm not trying to be, you know, whatever about that. I'm just, But I'm just saying, you know what? Then there's a particular way as a son that you should be praying. And if you're going through suffering, there is a particular way in which a son goes through suffering. So for me, it wasn't a big leap to just go sonship suffering. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Because if you're not doing it as his son or daughter, then you're doing it like somebody in the world. And see, and I, I definitely don't want to have that tag. Okay, so <clears throat> I just wanted to say all of that is in view of sonship. Now, I know some folks don't like that term because they disagree with things that I teach, and that's okay. I, I like the term sonship because that's actually who I now am. I'm his son, and I'm not ashamed of that at all, so I'll wear that label, and that'll be fine. And I didn't invent that label, but, but glad to wear it. Uh, now, I want to say one more thing, and that is there are three particular views that people hold to, and, and, and the reason we're doing this study is because I'm trying to do three things tonight. The first thing I'm trying to do is, look, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you preach or teach. There will all be always be those people who oppose you. I've come to grips with that, and I understand that, and that doesn't bother me. Power off. Power on. And in the old days? Hearing. And in the old days, I did not respond to that in a godly fashion. But you know what I did? I loaded up the cannons and fired right back. Sometimes when you watch that happening between Power. others, all of a sudden you're able to really see what that looks like. And then you're able to say, oh, wait. Oh, so maybe I should do that differently. Well, really now, because we've been through that doctrine in Romans, I understand that these men, and I'm really Me too, pairing. I, I'm trying to do this the right way. I'm going to try to persuade them of what's in the scripture. And I'm going to do it in a way that is not usually done these days. I'm going to do it without calling them names or denigrating their character or trying to discredit them in the eyes of their people so they won't listen to them anymore. They'll just listen to me. I'm not going to do any of that. These are men that I'm going to have to spend eternity with. They're going to be part of the body of Christ. And you know what? I, I finally determined at some point in the past that the Lord is going to sort all of that out, and that's not my job. So I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And so hopefully, the th that's why I said the first thing I'm going to do is try to persuade them the third thing, I'm skipping number two, I'm coming back to, the third thing I'm doing is I'm trying to provide a model for how to respond to people who are um, being adversarial. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know what, we really need that. So I'm going to try to do it that way. So I won't be using the words stupid or have no clue. Those were things that were in my vocabulary. And you know what, I, all of that, that is just the way that you develop of attacking people, you know, when really, you know what, if you really value, and when I was talking about loving them as my brothers in Christ, 
you realize I'm not talking about an emotion. I'm talking about making a decision to value and esteem them in the same way that my heavenly father does and for the same reasons he does. The second purpose in this that I skipped over is because I know some of their people listen to what we do and that's probably part of what irritates them because they listen and then they go ask questions about that. So, you know what I want to do is I want to give those people some hope about how to handle sufferings. And I think, so maybe I can persuade some of my fellow preachers. Maybe I can help some of those folks that watch us from the outside. And maybe I can model how this is supposed to be done in a way that will actually glorify the Lord in the end. So there's the three things that I'm trying to do in this. Okay, and so... There are some benefits, and I told you already, I'm going to give you 15 benefits of being able to go through sufferings with the doctrine, and that's, that's going to comprise these first two sessions. There, there is going to be a follow-up to this. It's the natural thing, like how do we do that? But I want to convince everybody or persuade everyone of, of what we're talking about here. Now, there are three doctrines in, in general that pertain to this issue in which they disagree with what most sonship preachers would be preaching. And the first, the, the first of those doctrines is the issue of the joint heir inheritance. They would say that everyone is a joint heir and that phrase that follows it and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. They would say that is not conditional. We, you're, you're pretty familiar with this thing. We've been through it. Okay. The second thing that they're going to say is when it concerns the adoption, they're looking at a verse in Romans chapter 8 where Paul is actually now describing the end of the adoption process, and they're saying you don't get adopted until the redemption of your body. I know what that verse is, but I also understand that verses prior to that, Paul tells you that when you trusted Christ, you were given the spirit of adoption. That's the beginning of the process. The thing ends at the redemption of your body, and that is a process that runs from start to finish. And if you understand what Bible adoption really is, then you'll understand you're supposed to be engaged in that process right here and now. And so I'm just, and again, this is not meant to be a defense of this, but this is the, this is where the issues, the sticking points are, so to speak. And the third one is this idea of suffering. And they'll say that everyone who is in Christ suffers to one degree or another. And if you suffer, just the suffering alone is what qualifies you for the reward of reigning with Christ in heavenly places. Now, I disagree with all three of those, but I understand what they're saying when they say it, and I think I understand why they're saying that. So what I would like to do is actually show you some, some things. So this is the one, because this one is the, I mean, th th this one is too, but because this one is the issue of reward, this is the one they really have a problem with. And then they would think, look, if you suffer, you're going to reign with him. But that, I, our, our apostle just doesn't teach it that way. Okay, so now with that being said, let me see if I can um, move us on into the study here. Um, going to go to 2 Thessalonians. Now, you're going to get your notes at the break, so that'll be a good setup. I just want you to listen for this first session, and, and, and then after the break, you know, we'll really be into it. And uh, so we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians. Understand some things about the church at Thessalonica. These were advanced saints. They know the doctrine and they are under heavy, heavy persecution. Some commentators believe they were actually being hunted down because of their faith in Christ. Now, we'll talk more about that when we actually get over to 1 Thessalonians, but I do want you to understand that they really are under tremendous suffering, and Paul alludes to that in his letter to them. Now, because they're in advanced assembly, Paul is not going to the trouble of teaching them everything that, there's, that they already know as though they don't know it. 
Why is it important for you to know that? Look, when someone is advanced enough, you can make a statement to them that tells them volumes because they understand what's involved in it. That's what Paul's doing with the Thessalonians. Why is it important for you to know that? Because Paul is just making general statements to remind them of some things. And if you think that that is the sum total of the doctrine, you'll have a very incomplete understanding of it. That's the problem with not being over in 1 Thessalonians because you don't understand everything between, you know, Romans and, that they're, you know, they would have all that in their thinking. Okay, so having said that, let's go to the first scripture here in 1 Thessalonians, and I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul says, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. Do you understand what that, what that means? He says, hey, I'm kind of bragging on you guys to these other churches. We glory in you to the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. So Paul is applauding their patience and faith in the enduring of these tribulations and persecutions that they're undergoing. Now, in this particular case, this word faith, sometimes in your Bible, when you talk about faith, you're talking about putting your trust in something. But other times in your Bible, when it says faith, it's actually talking about faithfulness to something. And I think this is one of those cases where this is talking about their faithfulness to something. But it really is not going to matter at the end of the day if you think it's their trust in something because I could make that case either way. All right. So Paul starts in verse 5 by saying their patience and faith, that's the manifest token. What is not the manifest token is the persecutions and tribulations. Everybody with me there? Okay. So in verse 5, he says their patience and faithfulness are a manifest token, and he reminds them that there is going to be a reward for being patient and faithful in the face of those tribulations, that ye may be counted worthy of... Does that strike a familiar chord with anybody? Didn't we just get out of that study on salvation and Israel's program? And you remember what Jesus had said to the members of the believing remnant? that ye may be counted worthy to escape those things and to stand before the Son of Man. For Remember all that? Well, now here comes Paul, and he says that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. And he's not saying you'll be counted worthy to be saved. He's talking to people who are already saved. And by the way, you're not, you're, that's something he does, right? That's not something we do. But when he's talking about being counted worthy of the kingdom of God, they understand what he's talking about, worthy of having the reward of faithful saints in that kingdom. And what is that reward? They know what it is. Do we know what it is? To reign with Christ. That's what the real, and we'll see some verses that are about that here in just a moment. So even though Paul doesn't say it there, this is one of those instances when the assembly is advanced enough that all he has to do is say it that way, and he doesn't have to explain it like they have no clue. They have, they have real knowledge about what he's talking about. So does everyone go through persecutions or tribulations or infirmities or any of these other things? Does everybody automatically go through those things with patience and faith? Now, all you have to do is look around and you'll see that that does not happen automatically. Now, I say that to you to raise this point. When, when, they, when, when, when some folks look at suffering, they're saying that reward is automatic just because they suffered. And what I'm going to show you is none of it is automatic. You have to, there is a way that you are to go through the sufferings. And here's the model with patience and faith. Why do you think Paul is making a big deal about glorying in them in the other churches if it doesn't matter how you go through it? Do you see my point? The reason it's worth mentioning is because of how they're handling the sufferings that are coming their way. 
Why in, the, why in the world would Paul even bring that up to other churches? Unless he wants them to emulate that. He wants that to be working in them as well. Okay, so I'm going to take you to the Second Timothy verse now. And again, this is Timothy. This is in the pastoral epistles. Anybody that's in Timothy ought to have known that all those things that are already sitting in Romans to 2 Thessalonians. What is that? That's the sonship curriculum for those sons. But when you get into the pastoral epistles, now you're going to go through the education as a father. In other words, these are written to pastors. They're supposed to do that. And so here's what he says. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. <laughs> if we deny him, he also will deny us. Don't get confused about this. This is all in, in the same context. If we deny him does not mean that we're standing up and saying, oh, no, Jesus is not my Savior. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I don't trust in him. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about people who have already done that. And, and that's not the test here. The deny him is to refuse to respond to the sufferings appropriately. What do you have in Romans 8, 17? And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer. Somebody want to complete that? Thank you. With him. And that is the important part of the verse. If it wasn't, and that's a qualifier for the verse. If, God, if just suffering alone would do it for you, you could have left that off. If so, be that we suffer. See, then it would be automatic, wouldn't it? But it's not automatic. It's if so be that we suffer with him. Now you just have to determine what does it mean to suffer with him? And that doesn't mean he's up there suffering. And you're, and you're supposed to just suffer with him. Okay, well, we'll talk about that at the very end because it really gets to my 15th point. That I wanted to bring it up because this is the verse they're looking at. Look, if we suffer, we shall also, but you understand by the time you get to 2 Timothy, you've already had all this other teaching that tells you it's not just the fact that you're suffering. May I say to you, not all responses to suffering are created. Are created. Okay, so I want to give you, I want to give you three ways in which how we respond to suffering makes an impact. First, it impacts us. Those who are actually going through the suffering circumstances, it impacts us right here and now as we live in this world. The second thing is that it impacts men and angels. I pulled that out of something Paul said, okay? And, and th there are people who will watch you and be impacted by how you handle tribulations and things that happen in your life. And it even makes an impact in the angelic realm that your eyes can't see. But God is putting that on display. The third thing here is it impacts, I believe, it impacts our future reward. Now you say, no, I'm not going with that one. Okay, so I'm going to say this to you. Fine, leave that out. Leave that out. I'll be perfectly happy if folks respond to their sufferings out of the doctrine just for the benefit that it gives you right here and now. Because if you get that right, you don't have to worry. The reward will sort itself out, won't it? Okay, so <clears throat> because of those, I, now I want to enlarge on those three just for a moment here. And, uh, and, and, and talk about our response to suffering. So there's two ways. There's actually two wrong ways, but there are, there, there's three ways that we respond to suffering. Th this, one, this one is a response of the flesh. And that first, oh, I guess I need an L in there, don't I? Okay. So this is a response by the flesh. And when people respond by their flesh, here's what may happen they may become overwhelmed by their sufferings. Have you ever seen that happen to someone? Yes. And so when, when that begins to happen and they're, and, and they're kind of just getting, you know, severely and adversely affected by the things that they're having to endure, what do they start doing? Well, the first thing they do, I'm talking about if they're, if they're a believer, and this is all we're talking about here, they begin to question God. How could God let this happen? Someone said, I remember Rick and I were talking and somebody said to him, 
why do good people suffer? And Rick said, well, there are no good people. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, but people think that. Why, why is God allowing this? And, you know, we're trying to serve the Lord here. Why, why would God let that happen? Those are things that Satan certainly uses to put doubts in the minds of people when they don't understand what God is doing and why he's doing it that way. So they begin to question God. And really, those questions are really accusations about God's not doing what he's supposed to do. Okay. The second thing is they begin to whine and complain. And so they do. Have you ever known anyone that does that? And, uh, and, and you know what? And they, I'm not saying they're not really suffering, but when that is their response and they whine and complain about it, you know what happens? They, those, those effects become greater on them, okay? Now, and by the way, the secret is not just, a, okay, I'm not going to whine and complain. No, no, see, that's not the answer either. Okay, so I want to show you something in the scripture because I think this is a perfect illustration of what God thinks about the difference between people who have a godly response to their sufferings and people who have a fleshly response to their sufferings. So I'm going to take us back into Israel's program, and I'm going to show you some verses here. We're going to look at four verses, and I want you to look carefully at what we're going to do. The first one is going to be in Exodus chapter 16, and, and you'll be able to tell immediately what's happening here. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They've been in captivity for 430 years, and when they come out of Egypt, and they get into the wilderness. Remember, they, 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 remember they spent the, sent the spies in and they came back. They went, oh, we're like grasshoppers. We can't do it. And God said, okay, well, I'm going to let this generation die off in the wilderness. And then I'll take the next generation in. So they're out there in the wilderness. And guess what? When, and when, that, when, when the Bible says wilderness, you do understand we're not talking about like the woods up in the northwest United States. We're talking about desert areas, Okay. And so, um, so you're going to run into some problems out there. Can anybody tell me what a, a problem might be that you would run into in the desert? Okay, that's a good one. Okay, so we don't have to go any further. All right, so here we go. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 2. So, oh, I, I forgot I gave you the, I'm giving you this on. So, so some are adversely affected by the suffering. They begin to question God, and then they whine and complain. Good, I don't have to write that. Okay. So here we go, Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. You know what struck me about that? The whole congregation. Oh, my goodness. Now, drop down a chapter, 17, 3, and the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. Now, is that a physical need? Yeah, we're not talking about a spiritual attack here. We're just talking about we need water, right? So they've got a situation that they're facing here, and are they whining about it? Well, you know what they're doing now is they're charging Moses with mismanagement. Oh, good. You couldn't leave us down in Egypt. You decided to bring us out here in the desert and kill us. We just won't have any water. Okay, let's look at the next one. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness. They're not getting better, are they? Really bad. Okay, now that we're looking at that, uh, is God expecting something better out of them, do you think? It's a trick question. Let me ask, do you think it makes any difference to God how they react? Yeah, it makes a big difference to him. And I'm gonna say this, if it makes a big difference to him how they react under the law, 
it makes a bigger difference how we react under grace. Now, someone is going to hear that and go, that's not true. We'll let Paul answer that in just a second. But before we do, let's take a look at what God has to say about all of this. And bear in mind, I'm trying to make the point, it makes a difference to God how we respond to suffering. So here it is for them. Numbers 14, 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me, Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, uh, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Do you think he's unhappy? Do you think it made a difference to him? See, I, it made a huge difference. So when I make this point and say, hey, you know what they were supposed to do? They were supposed to trust God. And if they were complaining, that ought to have been a signal to them that we're not thinking about this the way that we're supposed to. Now, that's the way they should have done that. Did they with patience and faith endure their situation? They did not, okay? And so, now I know someone is going to hear this and going to go, yeah, but you had to run back to Israel's program to get that. Well, okay, so I would like to take you to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Now, when we get back in 1 Corinthians next time, we're going to be in chapter 6. So we're not at 10 yet, but I need to preview this for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Who writes 1 Corinthians 10? The Apostle Paul. Who's he writing to? And they are members of the body of Christ, living in the dispensation of Gentile grace. Okay, let's just get all that straight. So here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. When he says, I would not that you should be ignorant, you know what he's saying? Don't miss this. I don't want you to miss this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. You realize that's the, he's going to talk about the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Did we read that just a moment ago? Now, these things were our examples to the intent. And now he's going to give you a whole laundry list of things they did that you shouldn't do. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Here's the one we're after. Verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And now look at verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Does Paul think that's relevant back there? See, I'm not making that up. Our apostle told us when you see that thing happening back there, that's supposed to have some kind of meaning for you. Does Paul understand the dispensational change? He kind of does. But is he afraid to go back and look at that and say, you know what, what they did back there was wrong and that is supposed to be an example for you. I'm just going to say it like this. If, if that was wrong for them under the law, those of us who are under grace better really pay attention to that. Do you, do you see that principle? So I'm going to ask you, did it make a difference to God how they went through their suffering? Well, if it made a difference to them, and there are examples, it is written for our admonition. Do you think it makes a difference to him how we go through? See, I'm convinced of that. Now, I could stop the sermon right here. 
I can stop it right here and go, you, don't, you, you know what? You can't argue with this point. But I, but I have more to say about the, the rest of this. And so let's, 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 let's continue with our outline here because I, I'm trying to undo this thinking that you're going to get the same reward no matter how you go through the suffering. It's just the fact that you suffered. They didn't get the same reward. And you won't either. Don't be fooled by this. Okay, so here's the rest of the outline. And I know I got it on the PowerPoint, so I don't have to write it now. So people question God. They whine and complain. They become overwhelmed by the events that are happening in their life. And you know what happens when people truly get overwhelmed by the circumstances that they're going through? People quit trying or they just quit living. What's the result of that? Some folks become bitter. Some folks are just angry all the time because of the things that are happening in their life. Some people experience anxiety and fear and it just, it just freezes them. And some folks fall into a depression. I mean, we could list all of those things. But there's another response to our flesh right here. And I'm going to call this one the stiff upper lip. I think the English came up with that. By the way, this one, this fleshly response is spiritually adverse to you as a believer, and it does not glorify God. Would there, could we agree on that? That doesn't glorify God? Okay, so now here's the, here's the second fleshly response. Some adopt the stiff upper lip response, and what am I talking about there? By a sheer exercise of their will, they're going to tough it out. You say, well, isn't that better than being overwhelmed by it? It's just a different wrong response is all that is. But you know what? If you don't know the godly response and you're going to try to make it through, this is, where, this is where people go. You know what these are? These are coping mechanisms to try to get us through something when we really don't understand the provision that God has made for us. So what's the result of this one? Well, folks get bitter about this one too, don't they? And some of them are angry all the time because of the things that are happening. Now, I'm going to give you another one. Ambivalence. You know what this one is? That's the bumper sticker on the back of the car that says stuff happens. And they just go, look, it's just, that's just the way it is. Don't get all worked up over it. You just go with the flow. It doesn't matter. Sometimes things go your way and sometimes they don't. Is that the way Paul was taught by the Lord Jesus to view his sufferings? No, he was not the originator of the bumper sticker. He has a different way of looking at that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Stop looking at these two responses and saying, well, this one's better than that one. You know what that makes me think of? Saul, King Saul. Do you remember what the Lord had said to him when they went in to conquer? And he said, you know what? Don't, don't take any spoil. Don't leave anything alive. Why? And, and you remember, and then Samuel shows up and he says to Saul, what's that bleeding of sheep I hear? And, and remember what Saul said? Oh, we saved the very best to sacrifice to God. And you know what Samuel's response is? Why would you save the best of that which God has rejected to offer to him? He's rejected both of those. Don't talk. I, I hate it when, when I hear people say, I don't hate them, but I hate to hear them say because I know what they're thinking. Well, that's better than that. They're both rotten to the core. Neither one of them work in a godly fashion. They're contrivances of the flesh. And one of those is not really better than another one. So there is another alternative, and that's the one that I would like to talk about. And so here, here is the godly response. And we'll, we'll, we'll put it up on the PowerPoint here. So the first one is, is to the, well, and by the way, these are, that one's spiritually averse. It doesn't glorify God either. Okay, so the godly response to suffering, now I'm going to give you 15 benefits to the godly response to suffering. And here they are. 
point A, I'm sorry, it's just the way the, the deal did it, okay? Point A is a godly response to suffering puts the power and the sufficiency of God's grace on display. Now, the thing you have to understand about this is, well, let's just read the verse. So Paul is, he has a thorn in the flesh. He said, I prayed three times for God to remove it. But instead of removing it, here's what God finally says to him. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient, you know what he's saying? I'm not removing the thorn. Well, see, for most folks, that's not the, that's not the answer they want to hear. But what is the answer? The answer is God's grace really is sufficient. And so have you ever gone through it? And I'm just going to take you back in your life. Have you ever gone through some difficulty and you prayed for God to take it away and he didn't? Now, look, we pray for some things to get taken away and they were just going to end anyway. And then when that when it happens, you know, we think, you know, we talk God into it. But I'm, so I'm just going to talk about the ones that didn't go away. So I'm going to tell you that just as it was true for Paul, it is true for you and me too. His grace is sufficient. And that's sufficient to do what? For you to, with patience and faith, endure your tribulations and sufferings. That is what is, is sufficient to produce in you. I believe that God's grace can sustain us when we cannot sustain ourselves. I believe when a problem is too much for us to handle on our own, God's grace is sufficient for us to be able to not just survive going through it, but to actually flourish as a result of that grace working in us. And I'm talking about flourish spiritually. There is no suffering that is so great. Look, I, I know we're sitting here and I know you're all assenting to this. You've, you've heard th these things before. But do you realize that there is someone that's going to listen to this, that this will be the first time that they will have heard about this provision? And they're wondering how they're going to continue. And I'm trying to say there is an absolute way for you to continue. The grace of God is sufficient to handle any problem that comes our way. Wouldn't we all like to experience God's grace rather than the consequences of suffering. I mean, I, I, I think we would. Paul did, and we can too. So the first benefit for learning the doctrine and living out of that doctrine is because we can obtain a grace that is greater than all of our suffering. Grace can hold you up when you can't hold yourself up, and it will sustain you when nothing else will, and that becomes a spiritual exercise whereby we grow in grace. So that problems that earlier would have destroyed us, we can now handle those problems as well. And when we have to live with some kind of infirmity, and look, I, 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 want, I, I was tempted to pause here and give you illustrations, but I think everybody knows somebody that something is going on in their life and they're just having to live with that every day because that will never go away and that will never change. Or some circumstance what a comfort it is to know that God's grace is sufficient to keep you from being overwhelmed by your adversity. But listen, people don't automatically appropriate grace just because they are suffering. Do you agree with that? Or else everybody would have that grace, but they don't. What am I, what's the point I'm trying to make? You don't get any of this automatically. This is happening in a, response, in, a, in a godly response that's right out of the doctrine. Here's, the, here's point B. It creates a godly perspective toward, our offense, toward offenses. That's things that are done to you. So when, and let me give you the verse for that. I'm going to show you. Here's how Paul changed his perspective. Remember, he prayed three times. Lord, could, I, could you take this away? Lord, could you take this away? Lord, you could take this away. And when God says, hey, my grace is sufficient for you, look how his perspective changed. Most gladly, I really like that. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in 
infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecution, and distresses for Christ's sake. By the way, you see the mix here? I take pleasure in infirmities. You know what that is? An infirmity. Okay, I got, I got just a few minutes here. So an infirmity, that's a physical thing. That's not a spiritual thing. That's a physical thing. So you know what Paul is doing? He's mixing these right here. So some of these, look, persecutions, okay, that's the suffering of Christ, isn't it? Infirmity is part of the suffering of this present time. So he's mixing these up. What does he mean in necessities? Paul couldn't drive a Rolls? You know what? He's really talking about the necessities of food and clothing. He's talking about that in persecutions and distresses. What, what does Paul say about that? I take pleasure in those things. Is that a change in perspective for him? Look, only grace can do that. And when we, when we get that grace operating us, now we're able to look at those things in a whole different way than we looked at them before. Um, so let me get to this next one because I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get this first one done. And that, well, let me just put it up on the PowerPoint. So the next one is, and I put these two together. It matures us in the faith and it activates the power of God to work in us. Now, I think you can automatically see how when grace is allowing you to, with patience and faith, endure your sufferings and that changes the way you're looking at those things which are happening to you and by the way you all understand paul's not saying oh i'm just i'm just tickled for bad stuff to happen to me i want bad stuff to happen why could god why could paul take pleasure in infirmities and persecutions and necessities and all that how how is it that most gladly i will glory in these things how can he say that because he understands the real value of the spiritual work that's being done in his inner man, and he is not so concerned about the stuff that's being done with his outer man. So he's, you know what? There's a shift in thinking that has to take place. And it's got to take place in us, where we no longer look at the physical things that are going on as the most important thing, because that's how the world teaches us to think that you've got to look at what's going on in your inner man. And if that, and if grace is work, look, grace doesn't suddenly mean you're not broke. Grace doesn't fix your burned up car engine. Grace doesn't make the air conditioner cool. Those are outer man things. But grace sustains you even when the car is broke down and the air conditioner is not working. And instead of looking at these things and wondering, why me? This is an opportunity for something to happen in your inner man that you can't get any other way. So it matures us in the faith and it activates the power of God to work in us. Couple of verses, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Because it's in our weakness that his strength shows up. That only happens, that only happens through grace. Let me give you one more. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. If your inward man was renewed day by day, it wouldn't, happen. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter what was happening to your outer man. You would not throw in the towel you would not give up because it's the inward man that makes all that work and i want to show you why i keep saying things like this when i say look you do understand that the things that we're going through now this life this life is just a snap of a finger compared to what is yet before us how long are we are, are we going to have to get this together and be faithful. It's just that, it's just, and so Paul is making that kind of a comparison when he says, for our light affliction, Paul's not calling it light affliction because it didn't have a heavy toll on him. Just read the list of the things that happened to him. But he's saying in comparison, 
a light affliction which is but for a moment. Now, did Paul live with these things for decades? He did. But he's saying, look, this is, in the grand scheme of it all, this is a moment, this light affliction, which can I take you back to Romans 8? Which the sufferings of are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's the way Paul's looking at it. And if you don't look at it that way, you may encounter a suffering that you just cannot overcome. So he says, and, and, and that light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So there may be physical things happening to your body that you can't stop, you can't control it, you can't reverse it. But do you realize that's not the real you? What you're looking at up here is not the real me. The real me is in there. But, but you can't find it. The doctor can't cut this body open and go, oh, there he is. The real me is the part that can be renewed day by day. Is my body getting older? Look, you know what? Here's the thing. Nobody wants, <laughs> when you're young, you just can't think about it. This is no knock on y'all. I was young once. I know you don't think that, but I was at one time. I was young. And you know what? Things, you know what? Don't, you just don't, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Tracy tonight, and she goes, Dad, what'd you do to your arm? But I don't know if you can see it. She said, what'd you do to your arm? And I went, where? She said, right there. And I'm looking, I went, oh, I don't know. When you get older, stuff just happens. And, and it's not like when you were young. In the young, you know, when you're young, you can fall off the roof and just get up. You know, when you're old, <laughs> never mind. Here's the next one. Here's the next benefit of the doctrine. John? Far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. That, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, that's what makes it incomparable, isn't it? Yeah, all the superlatives that are in that. So here's E. It makes us more than a conqueror. So <laughs> let me give you the verse. You already know it. Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And now he gives us seven categories of suffering. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That last one is death, right? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long or counted sheep for the slaughter. That's a quote out of Psalms. But you know when Paul quotes that, he's quoting that to say, I know how you feel about it. We're like sheep for the slaughter. You know what? That quote out of the Psalms was what the believing remnant was crying out to God about when they're out in the fifth installment and they're going, we feel like we're just sheep for the slaughter. And here's what Paul says about that. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Do you think you get to be more than a conqueror just because you're suffering? Or do you have to respond to the suffering out of the doctor in order for that to be a reality? I'm trying to tell you, this is not automatic. This comes, this is the value of learning the doctrine so that you truly can. And what does it mean to be more than a conqueror? It means that you didn't just make it through, but you actually came out on the other side stronger spiritually than you were when you went in. Able to handle more than you were before. So, wouldn't everybody love to be more than a conqueror in response to the sufferings of their life? Yeah, and you can be. But we don't become more than conquerors just because we suffer. Those verses in Romans 8, 31 to 39, when those verses begin to effectually work in you, that's when that gets produced. And that's all I'm after here, is saying, can't we do that? Can't we focus on that? That there really is a benefit to the people in the assemblies. So I'm going to end this one with this verse, Romans 8, 17, because I want to make a comparison here. We are more, in fact, does that verse up? We are more than conquerors. What? We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There's that prepositional phrase. Compare that with this, Romans 8, 17. And heirs of God, if so be... 
if so be that we suffer, how? This one's through him and this one's with him. You can't throw away those prepositional phrases because they qualify the statement. So if you're saying, how in the world do we suffer with him? <laughs> because when that doctrine is working in you and you respond to the sufferings out of that doctrine, guess what? That's the life of Christ in you. That's how you're suffering with him in that he's actually at that point living his life in you and through you. That's a difference we just don't hear much about. And that's got to be the reality for us on a daily basis. You become more than a conqueror, not because you're tough, through him. How, do you, how, how does that, through that grace that he gives you? Okay, so Paul doesn't just cut those off at the word suffer, but he adds those prepositional phrases and they're there for a reason. So that brings us to the end of session one. Okay, so I guess they got it cut off now. So, hey, did the stuff come?